Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. I chose you from the world to go and bear fruit that will last, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The Lord Jesus appointed 72 disciples whom he sent ahead of him in pairs to every town and place he intended to visit. He said to them, The harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. Go on your way. Behold, I am sending you like lambs among wolves. Carry no money bag, no sack, no sandals, and greet no one along the way. In whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this household. The peaceful person lives there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, they will return to you. Stay in the same house and eat and drink what is offered to you. The laborer deserves payment. Do not move about from one house to another. Whatever town you enter and they welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God is at hand for you. The Gospel of the Lord. Today is the Feast of St. Luke the Evangelist. Uh, St. Luke is a very interesting person from the early church. Uh, he was perhaps the most educated of many of those first Christians. So St. Paul was a great scholar of Judaism. Right? St. Luke was a great scholar in all of the secular arts and sciences. Right? St. Luke was a doctor by trade. And in the ancient world, becoming a doctor would have been kind of like you had to go through all sorts of schooling to get there, very similar in our modern day, which means that St. Luke would have had a great education all the way up until specifically learning about medicine. Right? So he was a doctor. Because of that, his writings right, are very accurate in terms of history. This is one of the really interesting things. I was just talking with some of the Wabash students last night that basically over the last hundred years in biblical scholarship, scholars have been very skeptical about the authenticity of the books of the New Testament and the Old Testament, very skeptical about the things that take place in the scriptures. And yet in our modern age, especially in the last 20 or 30 years, there is a huge swinging of the pendulum in biblical scholarship because so many things in the scriptures that people thought there was no way that these could possibly be true, right? Archaeological discoveries keep confirming different things in the scriptures. And then also the more we learn about ancient history and those ancient civilizations, the more we're realizing it is matching up and St. Luke is one of those cases where this happens time and time again. St. Luke, all throughout his writings in the Gospel of Luke and in the book of Acts, he's mentioning all sorts of different places and people from which we know a lot about from other historical sources. So presumably, if St. Luke was making these stories up or if somebody was writing this a long time after they had taken place, it wasn't a first-hand witness, presumably there would be a lot of historical inaccuracies, right, in the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. Right? And just to give you an example, my one of my seminary professors, he was one of these skeptical scholars, right? He once, he once said that he thought the Acts of the Apostles had to have been written at least 150 years after the days of Jesus, right? So somebody was writing it long after the death of Luke and Paul and all those people, right? And yet the more scholars study this, the more accurate they find Historically, all these different minute details are in Luke and in Acts. So this is one more example of history and archaeology confirming many of these things in the scriptures. Something else I find that's very interesting about St. Luke, as I said, right, he was a very well-educated man. He had certainly established himself in that ancient society. And yet St. Luke had the humility to leave all of those things behind and to go on all the different missionary journeys with St. Paul. And he didn't go on all of them. About halfway through Paul's ministry, St. Luke became one of his most faithful companions. 
When I was in Noblesville, there was a family in Our Lady of Grace who, uh, likewise, the husband was a doctor, right? And they had, um, they had adopted some children, right? Which, if you've ever adopted a child, you know there's a lot of financial hardships that come with that, not only from raising children, but also from the adoption process, right? And so he was a doctor, and he had adopted a few children, and he and his family made a very inspiring and radical decision to become full-time missionaries in Central and South America. This man makes a point when he's on mission, he doesn't tell anybody what his career is because he doesn't want anybody to know that he's a doctor because he knows as soon as he tells people he's a doctor, they're going to stop wanting to talk to him about the faith and rather they're going to want to bring to him all the different sick of the neighborhood. I always thought that was very striking, that that is their practice. This man who is a doctor, right, recognizes that what people need more than anything else is not to be healed physically, but spiritually. And St. Luke saw this too. This is the exact opposite of how so many people think in our culture. In our modern secular age, so many people have neglected to see the need for God and try to find happiness, contentment, and lots of different things, right? In their accomplishments, in physical health, in psychological health, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. Not that any of those things are bad. But what we need more than anything else is God. St. Luke saw this. His parishioner in Noblesville saw this. And I wonder if all of us truly recognize this. I'll give you an example. I think many of us as Catholics, I think all of us are very passionate about doing works of charity. Many of us, when we are raised in the faith, or maybe even in our current life, right, we find ways to serve the poor and the needy. Even when high schoolers and college students, often when they go on mission trips, right, most of what it is oriented towards is works of charity. I would say a large majority of Catholics participate in charitable works. But how many Catholics invest themselves in true ministry, which is not about somebody's physical needs, but about spiritual needs? How many Catholics have volunteered to be a catechist or teach in youth ministry or to lead a Bible study? As Catholics, we're a lot more hesitant to do those kinds of things. And yet I think if you read the Gospels and you read the lives of the saints, we should understand that all of those things are just as necessary as all of the works of charity. I think we as a church would do a lot better to instill that in every one of our people. All of us are called to be ministers in some way. We should be trying to find ways right, to pass on the faith, not just do works of charity as good and beautiful as those are. It's something for us to think about this morning.